Welcome back to Mental Wealth TV. I'm Amy Golding, Director of Psychology for the Workplace Mental Health Institute. I'm Peter Diaz, I'm the CEO of the Mental Health Inst Workplace Mental Health Institute, and we welcome you to the new year. Happy New Year. I hope you got a chance for a bit of rest and rejuvenation. Um, rejuvenation is the key, isn't it? Absolutely. Most people feel not rejuvenated, but a little bit more tired. Maybe we overate or, or, or drank a little bit too much. Well, that's something we noticed this year, actually. A lot of the organizations that we worked with seemed to barely pause for the yes, holiday season. They just kept going. Surprising, because that's never happened before, mm -hmm. which either we should be happy that they're thinking of mental health yes. all throughout, yeah. or part of me thinking, should I be concerned that people are not stopping and taking a break? Yeah. So <laughs> I'm ambivalent there. I know a lot, of, a lot of the HR managers, people in culture, directors yeah. that I was speaking with, they really wanted to just get a jump on their planning for the new year. And that's where most organizations are at right now, looking at what are the initiatives they're going to put in place for 2024, what are the needs of their people, what's going, what's going on in the world at the moment is actually impacting well, hugely on mental health of people as well. So. And wanting to be ready, I think that's commendable. That's mm -hmm. really good. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Absolutely. So what is the mood for 2024 going into the new year? What, what, there's a few things that we've seen out there in the world yeah. that are impacting well-being. Well, I, think, I think this is a good time for people to sharpen the axe. I'm not sure if you've heard that story mm -hmm. about the, the two um, logger men. You know, they were cutting trees. Woodchoppers? Woodchoppers. <laughs> <laughs> they are cutting trees. And um, one was cutting the tree, to, 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 and he was putting a lot of effort into it, a lot of effort. And he was listening to his colleague that he was, every few minutes, he was stopping. And he thought, I'm going to finish much faster than him because he's <laughs> taking so many rests. And um, no, it, what, as it happened, his colleague finished the log first. And he asked him, how did you do it? I heard that you were stopping. I thought you were taking it so slow. And I was really going for it. And I couldn't, and, and then you beat me. And we basically had the same kind of log. And he said, well, I wasn't really resting. I was sharpening my ax. Mm -hmm. So every time I was using my ax, it was more effective. Mm -hmm. And um, this is what we can do now. 2024 is here. Well, maybe it's time to sharpen air axes. You know, stop for a moment and what have, what have we done in 2023? Mm. What has worked? What hasn't worked so well? What can we improve on? And what kind of results and outcomes do we want for 2024? I'm not talking about setting new goals necessarily or may putting more pressure on yourselves, more projects. That's not what I'm talking about. Mm. I'm talking the thing that you are carrying from 2023 that are important to you, that are important to your workplace, that are important to your family. Um, what can you do better in 2024 so you get even better outcomes? It's about being strategic, yeah. really, isn't Don't it? Don't add more projects necessarily. Mm -hmm. You know, there's a, there's a lot of people that see that. Mm. The new year comes along and they put more stuff onto themselves. Mm. Mm. which is very overwhelming and mm. I don't want people to be overwhelmed mm. in 2024. Mm. Mm. Whatever you're going to do, do it well. Yeah. 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 Let's, let's get better at, at what we do rather than take on more stuff if, if, our, if our life is already full. Absolutely. Mm. So one of the things that I'm seeing... So sharpen your axe. <laughs> got it. <laughs> sharpen your axe. Yeah. One of the things that I'm really seeing in the conversations I have with workplaces, whether they're in Australia, Asia Pacific area, or the US and North America, and, and Europe as well to some extent, well, to some extent, there's a lot happening in Europe at the moment. But one of the big themes is this, uh, there's a lot of uncertainty. Yes. You know, and the political environment at the moment is quite on edge. Um, one of the big things happening is we've got the ongoing war with Russia, Ukraine. Mm. We've got everything that's happening in Israel and Palestine with, with that situation. Um, th that's creating a lot of uncertainty for a lot of people out there. And mm. of course, they bring that into the workplaces as well. But um, it's not just uncertainty. There's a lot of uh, unhappiness and um, anger associated with that because it is they're seen as unfair wars and, and people don't like unfairness they like mm -hmm. they like justice they like things to be fair mm -hmm. um, and, and definitely we, we're not in an even play field at the moment around the world 
mm. and the wars that have been started. Mm. Mm. So, I mean, obviously for people that are in areas where there's conflict, there's a huge impact on well-being and oh, mental health. Oh, of um, course. You know, that's quite a, usually mm. considered a traumatic experience. But even for us watching it on the news, reading about it, social media, there's a lot of rhetoric mm. around it. And so it's very easy to get caught up in all of that and and, and ha it have a negative impact on our yeah. well-being and and I've seen that that we would talk about it when we talk about vicarious trauma that idea that there's direct trauma when you're physically involved in a difficult event but then there's also indirect mm. trauma when you're surrounded by that information and it has a very real impact on people and it's very yeah. easy to get stuck in that rabbit hole going down yeah. news and articles and you know of greater or lesser quality a lot of that information yeah, that we're getting right. as well so and that, yeah, there's also that the aspect that when you're watching if you're watching too much news and that, and you're getting caught up with it, it's very easy for us to to hook onto the two main elements of a mental distress problem mm. or a mental illness, which are helplessness mm. and powerlessness. Yeah, you know, um, hope, helplessness. Mm. You know, that idea that it doesn't matter what I do is not going to work, and what should I try anyway? Well, what position am I in to do anything about and these international right. conflicts? Right. So you can create a, a, a an angst in our in our souls, in our psyche, in our spirits, mm. and that can, if we don't address it, mm. it can cause problems mm. later on. Okay, so, so it's this good is to be aware of this and 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 uh, see how we are coping with this. Well, this is very interesting because uh, a lot of people do start to think, well, what if these situations do start to impact on my actual life, my personal yeah. existence in the world? And there's, there's been a lot of movies out lately around the sort of end of world scenarios, um, which I think are very attractive to people because of this uncertainty, because mm. of these, these fears going on at the moment. And what we know from mental health is that anxiety does serve a purpose. Those fears, those uncertainty, mm. that anxiety, it serves a purpose in that it can prepare us if used correctly. That's the, that's the thing. Yeah, anxiety um, is, is that the, the body's mechanism uh, letting us know that something is amiss mm. and that we need to pay attention to it. It doesn't mm. tell us what it is, mm. but it tells us that something is not quite right. Mm. So what do we do, the average person, if we're aware of all this going on in the world, we're concerned that it may have some impact on us in some way. Um, you know, we've seen articles where people in Sweden, for example, have rushed off panic buying and, and really in that sort of mm. response mode. Is that a good thing to do? Is that a bad thing to do? How do we you know, get the balance right in terms of our well-being within all of this? I, I think different people need to do different things to feel psychologically um, protected. Mm. You know, mm. um, if if you're fearing that maybe finances will be an issue, it might be good to have a financial cushion of sorts. You know, maybe savings, cash savings at home. Or if you fear that um, water or food is going to be an issue. Because uh, remember, we're not talking just about Australia or New Zealand or Canada. We're talking about the whole world. Yeah. You know, Europe, the threat of war in Europe this week has become quite real mm. with some countries saying that they, they're thinking about starting conscription again mm. and preparedness mm. for war. Mm. Oh, this is quite serious yeah. talk. So we, so we're so here in Spain, so we're a little bit far away from the front yeah, lines, yeah. being the front line is supposedly being Russia. Um, but you know, those countries that are close to Russia, it's logical that they may have to look at things like water, like food, like so, electricity, etc. So here's the thing, I think within our communities, within mm. families, within workplaces, when we're having these conversations, some people would look at that and go, wow, that's extreme. You know, there's no need for any of that. You're crazy. Yeah. Like, what are you thinking about? And yet, for someone who is concerned about that, actually taking actions like you've mentioned could actually alleviate that anxiety. Yeah. And then they can, the important thing, I think, is to say, all right, what can I do that will help me feel better, feel more prepared? And then when I've done those things, stop. Like, okay, I've done that. I'm as ready as I can be because who can predict the future? Who knows what's going to happen? But it can't be at the expense of our mental health. It should be something that serves our well-being and gives us that sense of safety and security that we have a plan B. Exactly. And it, it, look, it, you can be reasonable about these things and you don't need to preach about them to other people. I mean, mm. if, if uh, having a psychological cushion of sorts is good for you, just do it. You don't need to tell other people that you're doing it. 
um, just be, be aware that you can go too far in addressing your anxiety. It's okay to have a certain degree of anxiety. You don't need to kill it out of your life. No, you don't want to be yeah. so blase. <laughs> yeah, but you don't want to be so blase, then everything goes. But you don't also need other people's approval in order to have a mm. psychological cushion of sorts. You don't need them to approve mm. of what you're doing mm. necessarily. So a balance is the key mm. word here. Mm. Uh, a psychological cushion is not necessarily uh, preventing everything that could possibly happen in the world. Right. We don't have control of those things. Yeah. So the question is, what is could happen that I'm concerned about? Mm. Could happen. And what would be a psychological cushion that if I have it, and even if these things that I'm concerned about doesn't happen, well, what's the it's big It's fine. Loss? I've got a sense of control. Yeah. Going back to your point about yeah. feeling hopeless or helpless, it right. gives you that sense of control. And it that hasn't I've destroyed taken my action. life in the meantime. Exactly. It hasn't yeah. make, made me a hermit. It hasn't, uh, I haven't spent all my money in this preparedness. Mm -hmm. And now if it doesn't happen, I'm ruined. Yeah. No, there's, there's a balance to this thing. Yeah. It's a cushion, yeah. not a bunker. I think there's another element. That's very good. It's a cushion, not a bunker. It's a cushion, not a bunker. Yeah. Um, unless you've got lots spare for a bunker, then hey, go Max, for it. I can building a <laughs> okay, bunker. Well, there we go. <laughs> At least go. But that's a cushion it's for It's with his spare change. <laughs> with his spare change, he's building a bunker. But it's kind of a cushion. <laughs> so th there's another thing that I think I'm seeing is having a huge impact on well-being just mm. generally is and we've kind of touched near the topic is the, those relationships with our friends and family around these kinds of topics. Yeah. So, and, and the obvious example there is what's going on with Israel and Palestine. You know, the, the level of um, what might be an interesting political conversation at the dinner table becomes an all out debate and becomes an unhealthy conversation. Yeah. And I mean, we've seen that on different topics over the past few years as well. There's definitely a lot of division on ideas and yeah. people having really hard conversations, which I think are important to have. And yet we've also seen people um, have damaged relationships because of it and some more loneliness can't because of it. thinking about things. Mm. You know, what we may be really comfortable to look into, um, I'm afraid of war, I'm afraid of this, or I'm afraid of that. Some people prefer not to think about it yeah. because it's they feel so helpless yeah. and it causes pain. Yeah. So if we initiate a conversation and people have a reaction, well, maybe that's our cue to stop yeah. and not, not talk the, about it not with the them. Person. Yeah. They're not the person. But some people, you start a conversation and they can't wait. Oh my God, I'm so glad someone else is concerned about this and they're wanting to talk, that's, mm. that's good. Mm. So you, you take those opportunities mm. and you talk with them. You know. Um, as much as you as, as they, they yeah. you have time and allowance for that, but yeah, yeah that's it's about having a bit of a social, you know, acuity and say, well, is this person connected to their pain around this, and they want to talk about it, or they don't want to talk about it. You know, mm. if it's a problem. And what about, I mean, just simply people that do want to talk about it, but might have opposing views. I mean, yeah, that's fine too. That's also, our, but and we have seen okay some people that. are quite okay to, mm. you know, we can have completely opposite ideas politically, but we can still be friends. Whereas other people, that's not possible. It's, mm. it's, we're too, too misaligned to be yeah. able to continue a relationship. And that's, that's really difficult. Yeah. And, and, and sad. I think the world ha is experiencing that polarity at the moment in which people feel that if you mm. disagree with me in a subject, uh, we couldn't possibly be friends. Yeah. You must be the worst human being in the world. The re that didn't happen mm. 30 years ago. Mm. People had different opinions and they remained friends. In actual fact, having different opinions and different angles was seen as a as good diversity. Yeah, in a sense, well, yeah. Because it shapes each other. It makes yeah. us be more balanced. So that's mm. a, a good kind of diversity. So if you're out there navigating all of this, then you're not alone. That's definitely mm. what we're hearing from, from the conversations we're having with and workplaces all around and the individuals. World. Yep. All around Absolutely. the world. <laughs> We've heard this. Yeah. Hi, I'm Emmy Golding, Director of Psychology for the Workplace Mental Health Institute. We hope you liked the video. If you did, make sure to give it a thumbs up. We have more and more videos being released each week. So when you subscribe, you'll get a notification letting you know when a new one's just been published. So make sure to hit that subscribe button and 
Don't miss out on this vital information for yourself, your colleagues and your loved ones.